A month ago, I told you about Stephen Wolfram's attempt to develop a theory of everything based on hypergraphs. And just the other day, I learned from new scientists that if he's right, it would imply a characteristic change in the emission of supermassive black holes that could be observable. That'd be very interesting, if true. So let's have a look. In my recent video about Wolfram's hypergraphs, I mentioned that most of the recent work on this seems to have been done by a young mathematician by the name of Jonathan Gora. I didn't know, though, that the two seem to not be on the best of terms, as Gora mentioned on X Twitter that spending the last five years watching Stephen take sole credit for ideas, insights, developments and discoveries that were the products of our collaboration has been a uniquely exhausting experience. This new work also comes from Jonathan Gora and is based on hypergraphs, but it doesn't seem to directly involve Stephen Wolfram. As a brief recap, a hypergraph is a set of graphs or networks that describe space-time. Not just space, but space-time. They have a finite resolution that on the one hand can reproduce Einstein's theories to good accuracy. On the other hand, it can avoid the troubles that Einstein's theories have on the shortest distance scales where singularities can form. This way, the hypergraphs might one day also help to recombine general relativity with quantum physics. Discretizing spacetime has of course been tried before, but most attempts have run into conflict with observations quickly. This is because in Einstein's theory, you just can't have discrete chunks of a fixed volume of space. This is because of length contraction. Something that's very big for one observer will be very small for another one and volumes of space can change. So the idea of having discrete space is itself incompatible with Einstein's theories. Hypergraphs circumvent this problem because they're treating space and time together as one entity and have deviations at small volumes of space-time. Not volumes of space, but space-time. If length contracts, then time dilates, but the product remains the same. So this doesn't result in any obvious problems with the symmetries of Einstein's theories. Gora now used these hypergraphs to describe what happens if a black hole accretes matter. The matter will spiral into to the hole and heat up dramatically along the way. This releases a lot of radiation. We can observe this radiation from many supermassive black holes in the middles of big galaxies. In a paper from February, Gora uses fluid dynamics to describe the accretion of matter onto black holes and says that the amount of energy that is emitted depends on how dense the hypergraphs are. You see this blue holy stuff here? That's a hypergraph which replaces the continuous spacetime. The less dense the graph, the higher the deviations from Einstein's theory. In the paper, he doesn't quantify it, but just somewhat vaguely writes that these results provide tentative evidence that there may exist astrophysically observable effects of the underlying discreteness of space-time arising within certain quantum gravity models. Then, a few weeks ago, he leaked on X Twitter some preliminary results, according to which preliminary simulations suggest that this could result in a boost in jet luminosity, assuming approximately Planck scale discreteness, of around two to three times over the predictions of classical general relativity. Big if true, as they say, because that might mean that we could be closer to finding evidence for the quantization of gravity than we thought. However, the reaction of physicists to this claim was deep skepticism. Alessandro Strumia writes, the physics is low energy junk falling in a hole. Effects of Planck scale physics should be tiny. And Ted Jacobson quoted a new scientist says likewise, I don't see how this idea can make sense. Any viable discreteness would be at a very small scale compared to the scale relevant for the physics of accretion. The reason they're saying this is that usually you expect deviations from Einstein's theories at a strong space-time curvature or at extremely high energy densities respectively. I know it's somewhat counterintuitive, but the space-time curvature near black holes is actually very small, and the energies that are involved there are also small, at least compared to the ones where you expect deviations due to quantum gravity somewhere at the Planck scale. That said, I think this criticism ignores the exact way that 
that hypergraphs implement the space-time discreteness. Ascara writes the deviations come from the way that hypergraphs subtly increase the ratio of the number of possible paths that cross into the black hole horizon because there just aren't any other paths. It adds to this that fluid dynamics is fundamentally chaotic. It can amplify effects from short to large distances. This is the famous butterfly effect. So I think the case isn't all that clear-cut and it's worth to wait and see what Gora is up to. Did you know that I have a free weekly newsletter with some extra news items? You can sign up at sabinehossenfelder.com slash newsletter. So what are we to make out of this prediction that supermassive black holes might test quantum gravity? Honestly, I strongly doubt that what Gora says is correct. I actually find this interesting for reasons that have nothing to do with quantum gravity. It's that Gora is clearly a mathematician by heart. So are Stephen Wolfram and Eric Weinstein and Peter Woid. But physics isn't maths! Mathematicians usually know nothing about theory development and seeing them do physics is like watching a rabbit hop into a snake pit. You know it's not going to end well, but you just can't look away. So don't forget to subscribe. To me, science is more than a profession. It's a way to understand the world and to solve problems. This is why I'm happy to work together with Brilliant, whose mission is to help you learn science in the easiest and most engaging way possible. All courses on Brilliant have interactive visualizations and come with follow-up questions. I found it to be very effective to learn something new. It really gives you a feeling for what's going on and helps you build general problem-solving skills. They cover a large variety of topics in science, computer science and maths, from general scientific thinking to dedicated courses on differential equations or large language models. And they're adding new courses each month. It's a fast and easy way to learn, and you can do it whenever and wherever you have the time. I even have my own course on Brilliant. That's an introduction to quantum mechanics. It'll help you understand what a wave function is and what the difference is between superpositions and entanglement. It also covers interference, the uncertainty principle and Bell's theorem. And after that, you can continue maybe with their course on quantum computing or differential equations. And of course, I have a special offer for users of this channel. If you use my link brilliant.org slash Bina, you'll get to try out everything Brilliant has to offer for a full 30 days. And you'll get 20% off the annual premium subscription. So go and check this out. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.